Uh, I am introducing the wonderful, the one and only, the man of the hour, literally, Kevin Black. Uh, he is a neuropsychiatrist for movement disorders. He sees patients with various diseases, including Parkinson's, and deals with some of the neuropsychiatric things that happen with Parkinson's, and he'll be talking to you guys about that today. He was my first boss. He recruited me when I was 21 years old and knew nothing. So the only reason you all have me is because he taught me, and I love him like a brother. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Okay, well, that was the best thing I did ever. <laughs> All right, now I have to see if I can make this work. Yay. Okay, this is the warning about why you shouldn't trust me, because I get paid sometimes by two drug companies that make drugs that are used in Parkinson's, Synovian, and Acadia. Um, I also wanted to mention, we do have a research study supported by the Michael J. Fox Foundation that we're recruiting for. It's completely unrelated to this talk in, in a way, but it's about um, trying to see if we can measure how severe the Parkinson's is with, uh, without our own biased clinical judgment, basically. Um, and uh, there's some information on it out in the lobby. All right, what else? Okay, so you don't need this slide, but of course Parkinson's disease is defined by the movement problems that uh, that you're all familiar with, things like stiffness and shaking and uh, slower, smaller movements and not falling over easily. Um, but when I first started working with Parkinson's patients, I was just finishing my psychiatry training and um, not knowing any better, I would ask people generic things like, so tell me, what's bothering you? And sometimes I would get these answers, but uh, Often they were flavored not like I can't move my leg, but it takes more energy or it takes more work to, to do stuff that I could always do before. I thought that was really a fascinating. And then, of course, a lot of times people would answer with all kinds of other symptoms that uh, aren't on the list here. Um, you're going to hear about constipation and pain and stuff from Johanna a little bit later, but all of these other symptoms, and all of these are psychological symptoms. Anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, uh, and so on. And those are the things that I'm going to talk about today. And we've come to understand gradually as a field over the last 20 years or so that, um, that these symptoms are really an integral part of Parkinson's disease. They don't affect every person or every person in the same way, but then again, neither does tremor or gait problems. Uh, if you stop and you ask patients or their family members, what is worsening the quality of life in Parkinson's? And if the little advancer thingy works. Um, there's a good bit, bit of evidence that the main cause of decreased quality of life in Parkinson's disease is depressed mood. Um, depressed mood along with anxiety, hallucinations, um, cognitive symptoms um, are not only the things that interfere with life the most for people with Parkinson's, but also for their caregivers. So I'm going to start by talking about depression. Um, psychiatrists are very bad at PR, if you hadn't figured that out already. And so we end up calling our most common problem that we see depression. And depression sounds like a word you'd use for when the cardinals lose or your girlfriend doesn't show up for a date or something like that. But it's, it's, uh, it's more than that, and that's what we're going to talk about. So about half of all patients with Parkinson's disease have depressive symptoms enough that that they're bothering their life or that they mention them to a doctor. Um, about 20%, I'd say, 20-25% of patients um, with Parkinson's develop a whole major depressive episode, and we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Um, the, the annual rate of new episodes of depression, new depression for the first time in somebody's life, I should say, in people with Parkinson's is about 10 times higher than in other folks the same age. So what to do about it. The first step is to make the diagnosis. I mean, think about it. If you went to your doctor and you said, I have a headache, and they said, here, take this, that would be a little disappointing. Because you first want to know, well, wait, why do I have a headache? What kind of a headache? What's the right kind of treatment for it? We do the same thing with depression. Here's, here's a short list of 
things that I think of when I think about what's causing depression in somebody. And we'll talk about each of these in turn. Um, let's talk for a second about the first one on this list, which I've labeled ordinary sadness and frustration. Um, uh, it's, you know, nobody's excited to have to have something be harder than it used to be or to not be able to do something or to have, you know, your sense of smell and taste affected or whatever. That, that's, that doesn't cheer you up. And, and, and nobody's immune to that just because they have Parkinson's. But let me just point out something about what ordinary frustration and sadness is like. It, it comes and goes. It usually depends on what situation you're in. Um, there aren't very many symptoms. You know, mostly it's like feeling sad or frustrated or tearful even or disappointed about things. <clears throat> and it usually responds to a support, you know, a clap on the back or whatever. People aren't excessively guilty and they're, they're not wanting to die. Um, I think it's pretty common. I think everybody has moments like this at some times. Um, I think... Uh, what, what do we do about it? I don't know the answer, I'll say, because if I thought I knew the answer, you'd think I thought I knew everything, and I don't. So, But here are things that seem to make sense, like support from friends or family, um, talking to other people who've dealt with similar situations or the same symptoms, uh, counseling, um, whether it's from a professional or from uh, like a pastor or a social worker, a um, psychologist, um, Changing life plans, getting occupational therapy input is very, very helpful for a lot of our patients as far as I've seen because, um, you know, finding a new way to enjoy something that you've always enjoyed but can't do the same way you used to anymore is something that they're really expert at. Minimizing the burden of symptoms, hobbies, chocolate, at least for me. Okay. So ordinary sadness and frustration. That's a big deal, but... I don't know much more than you guys do about it, so I'm going to stop there. Now, um, something that happens after the first initial honeymoon period of wonderful, this is the best treatment ever with treatment of Parkinson's, is that medications start to wear off. So like an individual dose of L-DOPA will work for an hour or two and then wear off before it's time for the next dose. When that happens... Um, Sometimes it isn't just the movement symptoms that, that uh, benefit fades for. There was a patient who, uh, I just put this quote in here, who likened the glow of the levodopa awakening to the switching on of a light and the equally abrupt return of Parkinsonian darkness to the light going off. That's why people call this on and off periods. is because of a Parkinson's patient about 40 years ago who, who described it this way. Um, and as you could tell, perhaps from the wording, Many patients find that their off periods um, come along with anxiety and depression. Um, this is hard for me to see. Okay. <laughs> so the point is that some patients will have normal mood most of the day long. Again, different from both ordinary life and major depression, uh, but then have these dramatic depressive or anxiety symptoms when they wear off. Some patients also get giddy or high when their medicine kicks in. Um, Overall, patients consider their mood fluctuations that may come with a dose of medicine more disabling than their motor problems, um, and caregivers consider them more stressful. Here's a picture of what this might look like. A neurologist in New York named um, Irene Richard had a bunch of patients fill out these little questionnaires 20 times a day um, with just a little one of those little I-beam things where you put a line across, across this line to show how you're doing right now. And um, this is answers from a patient who, over the course of the day, their mood was fine, kind of middle of the roadie, and then their ability to move got better, got worse, got better, got worse with their doses of medicine. This is, this is typical Parkinson's without any complications. But some patients went like this, so that when they couldn't move, their mood would go down, and when they could move, their mood would go up. That's kind of what I'm talking about. And in fact, um, mood and anxiety changes are some of the most common symptoms. You can't read that back there, I'm sure, but things like tiredness and slow thinking and anxiety and sadness and whatever are some of the symptoms that patients self-report as being what happened, what changes when their medicine wears off. Um, so the main way we tell what it is is we're not brilliant about this, but we just ask, does, does this sadness that you're telling me about, is it there most of the day or does it just come, you know, when you can't walk and talk as well anymore. Um, 
And also, it, it may not have anything to do with the situation. You know, you get bad news, you're going to feel bad. But if you're all of a sudden feeling bad and there's nothing going on, and then you're feeling happy and nothing cheered you up, that's, that's what you would expect to happen with this. Uh, Off-period panic attacks or other anxiety symptoms are very common. Um, it's fairly, uh, it, about 10% of patients have that, that picture that I was showing you like, like this where the mood and the movement symptoms come together. It's not always um, a direct effect uh, on mood, though. You get some patients um, who uh, their mood and their movement symptoms change during the day, but in no connection to each other, completely unrelated. And you get some patients who even feel worse when their medicine kicks in. Um, these are, this is less common. This is pretty common. OK. So we, uh, our, my colleagues here, uh, we, we looked back at um, all the patients in our electronic medical record system where we had flagged uh, mood symptoms that came and went with medication. And um, compared to other people with Parkinson's, people with clinically significant L-DOPA-related mood fluctuations tend to have longer duration of Parkinson's. Um, lots of them had dyskinesias, you know, the wiggly, twisty, jerky things. And um, there was lots of clinical depression, um, dementia, and psychosis. So the point is that this is more likely to happen later in the course of illness when um, patients are developing other side effects or other features of Parkinson's as well. Um, what do you do about it? Well, the ideal thing is to smooth out the effect of your DOPA dosing. Um, this can happen by increasing the dose, by switching the formulation to the long-lasting form, to adding medicines that end, end in Capone, or, uh, or the end in gene, like risagiline or selegiline. Um, the synthetic dopamine agonists tend to last longer than L-DOPA too, but bring their own problems. Um, we don't know whether treatments that work for depression in general would work, partly because, you know, what's the point of giving you a medicine to treat you all day when you only have symptoms an hour out of the day or two? Okay. So I've talked for a second about ordinary sadness and frustration, off-period depression. Um, let me talk about apathy for a second. No, I can't get up for that. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So apathy, um, the difference between this and typical, so when people are depressed, they feel apathetic. Okay. But lots of other people with Parkinson's also feel apathetic. Um, the, generally what we see from the doctor's side of the room is that family says, you know, Bob is really, really depressed, and you look at Bob, and he's just sitting there, and you say, how are you feeling, Bob? And he's like, I'm okay. And um, the patient often is less concerned than the family, because that's what apathy means. Um, the, the, the point is that people lose interest in their former activity. So I've asked a lot of people, so Bob, um, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, you were getting up every day early, going to work, doing stuff, watching football when you came home, blah, blah. And you're not doing any of that. You're just sitting there in a chair all day. Yep. You think that's a little odd? I guess so. That's, that's what I'm talking about. The main thing to tell it apart from major depression is all the other symptoms that we're going to come to in a minute about major depression are not there. People aren't guilty. They're not, um, it's not that they don't enjoy things as much. They just don't, don't much care. Um, so we try things like replacing dopamine, um, stimulants, you know, like amphetamine, speed, that kind of thing. That can sometimes help. Uh, there aren't enough good studies about it in Parkinson's disease. Um, but uh, the one good thing about it, in a bizarre way, is that if your loved one is, has a lot of apathy, they're not really suffering with it. I mean, that's the whole point, is that they're not feeling lousy. You, you look at them and you think, wow, their life could be so much better if they were out doing things, and we all understand that, but they're not feeling bad, so it's not... It's better than it could be, if you see what I'm trying to say. All righty. Okay. Let me talk for a second about what I called here easy crying. Doctors have all kinds of fancy words for this. There's a, a new one that, a name that was invented for the FDA, um, involuntary emotional, di uh, whatever it's called, dis display disorder, something like that. I forgot it already. Anyway, um, pseudobulbar affect, um, pathological laughing and crying. That one makes sense to me. The idea of easy crying is that P 
people either cry out of the blue or with really trivial things. Um, one patient I remember really vividly 20 years ago who came in and he said, you know, I mean, I'm like a tough guy all my life. And now, like, I see a movie with Lassie or something, and I start crying, and this is just not me. That, that's, that's an idea. People can also sometimes, more rarely, giggle um, when, it's not, when there's really nothing to laugh at. But um, this, uh, people are not necessarily sad when they're crying. This tells it apart from our ordinary crying. Normally, you know, I mean, other than weddings and stuff, like, we cry when we're sad, right? Um, but um, this is people crying just kind of at the drop of a hat. Of course, it, it can come with being depressed, too. That's, that's fine. But it can come by itself. When people aren't really sad, they're just leaky you know, in the eyes. Um, we don't... I, I'm not usually called upon to address this much because often the, the minute somebody gets started on treatment for Parkinson's, it starts to improve. Um, uh, also, uh, a low dose of an antidepressant, a dose like that internists prescribe, and it probably doesn't work for depression that often will help with this pathological crying. There's also a prescription drug available that's a combination pill that has dextromethorphan and something to make the dextromethorphan last longer in your bloodstream. Um, dextromethorphan is the um, DM in all the cough syrups, and you can buy it as pills. Um, if you're already taking most antidepressants, you don't need the expensive combination drug, but, um, but otherwise that might be a very reasonable possibility. So the point is it's easy to fix this if, if you recognize that it's a problem, if, if it's really bothering you. If it's not bothering you, don't worry about it. But, you know, I've had a patient or two come in where they're saying, it's embarrassing, you know, I mean, I'm out shopping and I start crying and I don't like that. So is there anything you can do about it? And, and yes, there's things we can do about it. Okay, fatigue. I think, Johanna, you're talking about that some, aren't you, also? So I'll just be brief, but fatigue is something that, um, that we see uh, basically, fatigue that so people have tried to get into this, and by asking a million questions, basically, you can separate fatigue into physical fatigue and emotional or um, cognitive fatigue. And the physical fatigue, like, oh my goodness, it just feels like it takes so much energy to lift my arms, that kind of thing. Um, that actually responds pretty well to, to anti Parkinson medications. Um, the emotional and cognitive fatigue is harder, and often it comes with depression, other, other depression symptoms. And finally, um, there are mood changes that can be evoked by deep brain stimulation. Those are usually pretty obvious, like, you know, hey, they turned it on, I started laughing, they turned it on, I felt bad. Um, uh, there may be longer-term symptoms that are harder for us to figure out, and that's a focus of a different research project, but, um, but you know, it's something to, the point is here, if you have DBS, you talk to the person who's adjusting the stimulation for you, make sure they know all the symptoms you're experiencing that seem like they might be related to a change in programming so they can play with that. All right, so last, let me come to major depression. How am I doing? Okay. Okay. So I, I've always liked this cartoon. What happens when I do this, Mr. Duck, and he taps him on the knee? My leg pops up. You wouldn't believe how many cases of that I've had since becoming a doctor. The reason I put this slide in here is because people say, well, depression and Parkinson's is like, duh, like who's excited about having Parkinson's? But it turns out, in fact, that most Parkinson's patients, maybe 75%, never have a, a spell of major depression. You have bad days, all that kind of stuff like I was talking about. But you don't, so it's not typical, it's not normal, it's not like just what you expect. Um, the other thing people think is, well, like I said, like, well, of course you're going to get depressed because you've got Parkinson's. Um, that doesn't work. The, the facts don't fit that story. Um, because, for several reasons, um, depression's more common in people who develop Parkinson's even five to ten years before, the, before they know they have anything wrong with them. Um, so it, it's not just, oh, I just found out I have Parkinson's, I'm depressed. It, that doesn't explain the picture. It's also uh, more common in, um, in Parkinson's than in equally disabled patients who don't have a brain disease, who have like muscle and joint diseases. And there's, among groups of people with Parkinson's, there's no relationship of the severity of depression with disability or with the extent of social support, things that you might expect if, if we could explain it all with a psychological theory. Um, so, what is major depression like? So the idea is that somebody is either sad 
or they're not enjoying anything nearly all day long, most, most days. So like if you have a bad day, that's life. If you have a bad day and then the next day you have a bad day and the next day you have a bad day and out of a month you have 20 bad days, that's what we're talking about. Um, also, major depression tends to be there in every situation. It's not that people don't cheer up a little bit, maybe if they get a hug or a steak or what have you, but, but, uh, but they're not really themselves, you know, no matter what's going on. Um, just so like one of my first patients after I finished training was a woman who came in and was telling me all these depressive symptoms and I was trying to figure out exactly when they happened. She said, well, basically Monday through Friday, eight to five. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> okay, I understand that, but that's not a disease, you know. <laughs> Again, so that's, that's what I'm talking about. The depression covers you in all different situations. Mm-hmm. A syndrome, meaning that you have a lot of other features with it. You have um, uh, loss of interest or enjoyment. You have um, often um, feeling of excessive guilt, uh, um, a uh, lower energy level, uh, trouble focusing your mind because you're worrying about stuff, trouble falling asleep at night, waking up early at four in the morning and then just sitting there because you can't get back to sleep. Um, And uh, depression may be the first feature of Parkinson's. Um, so who's affected? Somewhere, I would say about 25% of Parkinson's patients develop a major depressive episode. Um, interestingly, uh, men and women are equally likely to have depression in Parkinson's, whereas in you know, 20-year-olds without depression, women have uh, more depression than men. Um, often, the depression comes for the first time in life after um, you know, or just before developing Parkinson's. So, like, you're talking about somebody who maybe, you know, was through the Korean War and lost their friends and lost their parents and lost their dog, and they're fine. They weathered all that, and then f- five years before they develop Parkinson's, they start having depression. There's something funny going on that makes you think it's, it's different. Um, your doctor or your insurance company may call this major depression, but they also might call it mood disorder due to a general medical condition, or they may call it mood disorder, uh, unspecified mood disorder, or something. It doesn't matter. We're talking about the same thing. Okay, um, what can you do about it? I'm going to skip a bunch of slides here in just a minute because I want to cover a bunch of different topics and because I talk too much and I'll run out of time otherwise. But if we have time, I'll come back and talk about some of the other things. But I want to mention specifically cognitive behavioral therapy for depression and Parkinson's. So, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is a brief, as in like eight or ten visits, uh, focused, meaning we don't spend a lot of time like talking about your mother or something. This is talking about the specific features and symptoms. It's a proven first-line treatment for depression in Parkinson's. We couldn't say that um, 15 years ago, but um, Roseanne Dobkin, who was at, uh, in New Jersey, um, worked with Michael Menza there um, on doing the research to show that actually, no, this works really well. It works better than just spending time with people and talking to them. Um, here's a, a, a graph that shows the evidence from different studies, and, and it's summarized by this little lozenge, this little diamond here, that shows that um, the benefit is clearly on the side of you get better with the treatment. I'm showing you this partly because it's cute little picture, but also because I want to show that for medications in Parkinson's. So the point is that this works. If your doctor recommends it to you, um, you know, do it. I have a lot of patients who are like, no, like, it won't help to talk about how I feel. Well, just go do it. Okay, so (laughs) it works. It doesn't have any side effects. When's the last time somebody told you that about any treatment, right? I mean, this has actually been checked, and it doesn't have side effects. Like, they actually counted symptoms, you know, anyway. Besides, they're just talking to you, so... No, that's not true. They're not just talking to you. This is actually about practicing different ways to think about what's going on in your life. Um, so you get exercises, you get, you get homework um, about tracking the content of your thoughts and um, looking for kind of words that run through your head that trigger bad feelings. I could talk about more if you want. but Okay, as far as medications in Parkinson's, this is a slide I had back in like 2002 or something. And... You can ignore everything because at the bottom, basically, it says, you know, in 2002, a movement disorder society task force concluded that there there was really no good evidence about what was the right way to treat depression and Parkinson's disease. That's changed substantially. Um, um, At this point, 
But one thing to point out is that uh, the medications are prescribed anyway. So in this survey of over a million and a half people from Sweden um, who were age 65 and up, overall under 2% of them took any antidepressant pill. You know, most people over 65 did not. But in uh, Parkinson's disease, um, antidepressant use was more than 10 times higher with 22% um, of Parkinson patients living at home and 50% of patients in a nursing home or a hospital taking an antidepressant. That's probably appropriate. So do they work? So basically, this is one of those pictures like you just saw. They work better than a placebo. The only two on here that didn't work better than a placebo, by the way, um, one of them they didn't use the right dose, and the other one is a medicine that we just don't prescribe in Parkinson's anyway. Um, and there are several different kinds of antidepressants. I'm going to skip over most of that. You, you'll have that information, I believe, and I can come back to it with you if you want. The main point is that there are more, there are several classes of antidepressant medications. If one of them's bothering you, if it's causing side effects, you know, you can ask for that to be reconsidered. You should. Um, um, electroconvulsive therapy is probably not what you're thinking. If you've seen a movie that had it, then it's definitely not what you're thinking. <laughs> this is a, a weird thing because I can't tell you exactly how it works. Now, I can't tell you exactly how any of the antidepressants work. We have good theories. We think we know how they work, that kind of stuff. But the, the reason we still use it is because it works better. It's more likely to, to treat major depression than any of the other treatments we have, whether um, behavioral, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or medications. Um, it also works faster. Um, usually, about two weeks and you're starting to feel substantially better, whereas most medications take three to six weeks to really get to a, uh, a good benefit. And for patients um, who happen to have uh, hallucinations or delusions that are part of their depression, like, yeah, I'm the most evil person ever in the history of the world, and I'm probably going to die tonight because like, I, I think the devil's coming for me tonight or something like that, That's uh, then ECT is probably the first thing you should try instead of the second or third thing. It turns out that Parkinson's physical symptoms actually do improve with ECT, but, but not long enough to make it worthwhile as a treatment for that. Um, the most common side effect is a headache. Okay, we can, it's not fun, but we can deal with that. Um, people worry about whether it's going to make you forget stuff. Basically, the day you get treated, yeah, you're going to forget stuff. You're going to feel goofy because, like, you just had a seizure in your brain. And you had, an, um, you had uh, anesthetics and stuff. The day after ECT, um, some people with Parkinson's, that uh, can happen. And so we change the way that we administer ECT. But after versus before ECT, um, actually, on average, people are like a couple of IQ points higher a month or two after ECT than they were before. But that's not because it really makes you smarter, probably. It's probably just because like, you couldn't think straight when you were depressed. Um, but the point is that there's no evidence that it makes you dumber. Um, and your insurer usually actually likes it because they want people to get better faster instead of slower. Okay, other treatments. I'm not going to go over this except for I'll mention that in men with Parkinson's disease who have depression, um, there's some evidence that you're more likely to have low testosterone. So that's something to check out if you're a man with um, depression. Um, and then replacing the testosterone can actually help with the depression as well as other symptoms. The point is, of this slide is that your psychiatrist has tricks up her sleeve if the first thing that they try doesn't work. Okay, how do you take an antidepressant? <laughs> so you take the medicine every day. This is not like a headache pill where you take it if your head hurts. You take it every day even if you're feeling well. Um, for most of the newer antidepressant um, medications, if the side effects don't bother you, then the, you don't have to worry about it. If you're like, I think maybe my head feels a little bit different, just stop. Just don't worry about it. If it's like something really hurts, I'm having this problem, this is interfering with my life, of course that's different. But um, people are very careful, I know, with medications, and that's good. But you don't have to worry about these if, unless it's really bothering you. For some medications, you, you, you have to gradually work up to the right dose. You take a week or so at each dose until you get to a typical treatment dose. Once you're at the right dose, it may take as long as four to six weeks for full benefit. But generally, if it's not working three or four weeks after you start it, um, you probably either need more of it or a different pill. Um, what do I mean by benefit? Um, if nobody can tell you're better, it's not working. 
because I've had people come in, well, doctor, I've been taking this medication very faithfully for a month or so. Do you think you're better? Well, I don't know, maybe, possibly, a little bit. And, you know, I'm like, okay, it's not working. You know, you want to, at least somebody in your house needs to say, oh, my goodness, he's a new man. Okay? Okay. Treating depression, main points of it, it's not your fault. Okay? But you can do something about it. I think that'd be a great book title, don't you think? Like, you know, it's, it's not your fault. What are you going to do about it? Treatment does work. Because um, a lot of times when you're depressed, you feel hopeless. And you're like, yeah, the world's terrible, but it's always been terrible. And I'm just going to die anyway, so who cares? So you, you, you got to get past that and realize that your brain isn't working right. Treatment improves quality of life. Um, there are a variety of different treatment options. If a treatment isn't starting to work by four weeks, you need to change it in some way. If you're considering suicide, don't do that. Just go get help um, right now. Um, if you have hallucinations or delusions, you deserve to have a psychiatrist helping you. And ditto if you or a first-degree relative, that's like you know, father, son, child, um, brother, sister, um, if one of those people has bipolar disorder or a manic depressive illness, then you, you also deserve expert care. You need a psychiatrist. Um, if you're manic right now, it's like, what do I need to sleep? I've got too much to do. I've got too many things to go. I've got places to go. Then it's usually an emergency that needs to be seen right away. Okay. Whew. What time is it? Okay. All right. So I'm not done. All right. Psychotic symptoms in Parkinson's. So what does that mean? Psychosis. It doesn't sound like a fun word, but what it means is usually it's hallucinations or delusions. Okay, what does that mean? So hallucinations are false perceptions. It's like you see somebody that's not there, you hear things that aren't there, you feel things on your skin that aren't really there, taste things that aren't there, whatever. Some kind of sensation coming in that isn't real. Um, delusions means a false belief that isn't false just because you haven't learned it yet, or it isn't false just because everybody in, in your town thinks that. It's like oh no, this is really not true and we know it's not true, but you keep thinking it. Okay, in Parkinson's psychosis, the most um, typical symptoms are visual hallucinations. Often it's people like, uh, you know, setting the table for somebody and everybody else is like, why'd you put a plate there? Well, it's for that man that's sitting there. Okay, I don't see a man sitting there. Um, it can be animals, it can be things. Um, hearing things that aren't there is less common in Parkinson's. Uh, you can also have hallucinations of taste, smell, or touch. Um, Everybody's different, but kind of on average, often people will first have illusions, which, which we mean, um, you know that thing that happens if sometimes you wake up in the night and you're like, oh, there's somebody in my room, and then you blink a couple of times and turn on the light, and you're like, oh, that's my coat hanging over the doorknob or whatever. Um, that's an illusion. It's like you saw something that was really there, and for a minute you misinterpreted it. That's not necessarily a hallucination. But oftentimes that will... Um, but sometimes that will progress to genuine hallucinations. And sometimes people know that it's not there. Like somebody came in to me laughing one time. I said, what's up? I said, you know, Mr. Clean, that guy with the earring and the bald head and everything from the commercials, he was in the back seat on the way here. Like that was the funniest thing ever. Like they knew he really wasn't there, but still their mind was playing tricks on him. And then hallucinations, people can start to really believe that there's something there and um, um, delusions tend to come later. Delusion, common delusions are things like there are, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced there are people in a, in a workshop in the basement because I keep seeing them come back and forth and that's the only reason they'd be there. Or it could be um, that like my wife is cheating on me and there's no evidence for that. Um, yeah, so the person may know that some of these symptoms are not real and they're still there. Uh, one patient mentioned that he thinks that the seeing things that aren't there is more annoying than even his PD symptoms. He prefers to treat the hallucinations over the PD symptoms at this point. If he has to make a choice, of course, obviously you want all the symptoms better. So it, the point is that it can really be bothering your life. Um, about 8% of Parkinson's patient per year will develop hallucinations or delusions. So most people in the waiting room do not have any hallucinations or delusions. But if you wait 20, 30 years, over that course of time, most people will at some point develop hallucinations or delusions. Um, it's possibly the most troublesome complication of Parkinson's. It's definitely the main reason for nursing home placement. Um, the, it, it, it's, a, it's a clue that you're getting sick. 
um, often or that something's wrong with your treatment, one or the other. Um, it happens more in people who are older or who have some cognitive loss. Um, the longer you have Parkinson's and the more you're treated for it, um, uh, the, the risk seems to be a little bit higher. Uh, com uh, it often comes in people who have sleep problems, visual problems, um, depression, and um, specific anti-Parkinsonian medications are more likely to produce hallucinations than others are. So in the old days, they would do what they called the drug holiday. And one, one doctor wrote, um, this was not a holiday in the typical sense of the word, um, where they would stop all your anti-Parkinson medications. And if you survived that, sometimes the hallucinations were a little bit better. And that's basically the same as giving most antipsychotic drugs that were available before about 20 years ago. It would basically block all the effects of your Parkinson medicine, and so it's the same idea. Um, this is what we do nowadays for psychosis and people with Parkinson's disease. First thing we do is if you start seeing things or hearing things or whatever, it's a clue that something's wrong. That something could be because somebody just gave you a new prescription that's a bad idea for, for your, in your case. It could be because you're getting pneumonia or something and you're sick and confused or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you do is you, you look carefully for are they on medications, maybe not new, but medications that can cause confusion and hallucinations um, and, is, and do kind of a quick head to toe physical and check vital signs, maybe check for a urine uh, infection. Once you've done that and you don't have something to blame, <laughs> the next step is to um, reduce medications that affect the brain that you don't need. So you might have been on something for 20 years for migraines and you haven't had migraines for 20 years and you know, maybe you could back off of that as an example. Um, optimize anti-Parkinsonian drugs. You know, we all want to do that, but sometimes you have to stop and take a look and reduce things. The first things to stop would be anticholinergic medications. That means things that make your mouth dry and um, cause constipation. Benadryl. Like Benadryl, yeah. Um, amantadine is also has its uses in Parkinson's, but that's one I would stop first. And then if you're taking dopamine agonists, the synthetic medications, um, ropinarol, uh, pramipexil, what's the NU? Rotigotine, thank you. Um, we usually try to switch those over to L-DOPA, which has more bang for the buck in terms of benefit and side effects. Um, and then if possible, cut back on the dose. Like maybe you don't need as much as you're taking. Now most people, it turns out, by the time you get to that point, they need everything they're taking or else they're going to fall down and stuff. So you end up, at that point in the algorithm, you would add a medication. There's basically two drugs that are proven to work for psychotic symptoms in Parkinson's. One of them just came out this year, I guess, with FDA approval. That's um, pimavanserin. There's a table out there where they're selling it to you. And, but it, it, it does work. It works better than a placebo, and it doesn't really have um, any serious side effects. That's um, clozapine um, was the first medication proven to work for psychotic symptoms in Parkinson's disease. It's not approved by the FDA for that purpose, but nobody has financial incentive to go back to the FDA with a bunch of paperwork at this point. Um, it, it, uh, it also is, does not worsen movement symptoms in Parkinson's, or at least not enough that anybody cares. But it requires frequent blood monitoring. At, start, at the start, it's once a week. Um, after you've been on it for a year or so, it backs off to once a month. Um, and that's because of a rare uh, uh, side effect that could be very serious if it happens, which is it can kill off some white cells in your blood, make you, set you up for infections. But basically by monitoring it every week, you get early notice of that. You can stop the medication if needed. Um, it can have other side effects too that you can talk about if you get to that point. Um, the point is that it is available, it does work. Um, uh, you've got a couple of good options. Neither of these is really perfect. I think Johanna would, would tell you that too. And so, um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, we could still use some better treatments. Um, this is my advertisement here. We're, we're studying this investigational compound to see if it helps with psychotic symptoms in Parkinson's. There are green colored handouts at the end of that hallway on the left, and we'd love to enroll you if that's appropriate for you. Um, but it wouldn't be for everybody. But uh, the point is because I think we still could use better treatments and things that work by a different mechanism. Okay, anxiety and Parkinson's. How am I doing? Okay, I'll just talk really fast. <laughs> okay, anxiety and Parkinson's. Anxiety is really common. 
somewhere around 30 or 40 percent of people with Parkinson's disease have enough anxiety to bother them. Um, fascinating to me is that there are these there are places like Finland where they have re health records on everybody basically since birth and you can go back and do interesting studies like every single person who <clears throat> let's say in 2015 was diagnosed with Parkinson's or had was getting treated for Parkinson's you go back and look 10 20 years before see what they were doing so the the the, uh, the prevalence of anxiety is more than twice as common even 20 years before you have Parkinson's um, so it's not Again, because you're anxious because you can't walk. I mean, that happens too. But it's anxiety that you've been prone to ever since whenever, years ago. So why does anxiety matter? Well, it's very uncomfortable. So one, one small study, I just love the conclusion, was that panic disorder, in, in people who had had panic attacks, who also had had a heart attack at some point, um, um, they, they said that the panic attack was more uncomfortable than the heart attack. The point is that this is really not fun. Often what happens is you think that you're dying, you know, you think that uh, you can't breathe, that kind of stuff. It's really very uncomfortable. Also, anxiety leads to doctor visits and emergency room visits. Um, Joseph Friedman, who's a movement disorder specialist up in Rhode Island, wrote a beautiful short little essay about, like, why you should never go to the emergency room if you have Parkinson's. Probably a little exaggerated, but, but his, he had a good point. Like, you know, nobody knows exactly how you got to this point with all your medicines. They're not used to these doses, whatever. They're going to give you medicines that you shouldn't take in Parkinson's, that kind of stuff. Also, anxiety leads to a lot of lab studies. People get brain images. They get LPs. They get IVs. They get, you know, capture your urine for a day or two or whatever. You need those sometimes, but if you don't need them, you don't need them, you know. Anyway, and then medications that are given for anxiety often have their own side effects. People with anxiety fall more than other people, whether you have Parkinson's or not. Okay, so what kind of anxiety? So there's, a, again, just like with depression, there's a lot of reasons that, uh, or patterns that the anxiety comes in. The most common cause for anxiety in Parkinson's is probably major depression. So if you, if you have depression with a lot of anxiety, um, treating the depression often takes care of the anxiety without adding some other different treatment. Uh, I think I talk about akathisia in just a second. Um, one kind of anxiety in, that's kind of special in Parkinson's comes with internal tremor. So a lot of people, about half of Parkinson's patients will say sometimes like, like my hand feels like it's shaking and I look at it, I can see it's not shaking, but it still feels like it's shaking inside or I'm shaking in my belly somewhere and I can't see it. So that happens in people with or without anxiety, but people who have that internal tremor are more likely to also have anxiety with it. <clears throat> and in those patients, my experience is that just giving anti-Parkinson's treatments will help that, that kind of anxiety. Let me see. Okay, akathisia is just a fancy doctor word that means not sit down. Um, but it's a very uncomfortable sense of a need to pace or move your legs. And it doesn't just happen when you lie down at night like restless legs. So the classic idea would be, you know, somebody who's sitting in your office for five minutes and they're like, do you mind if I stand up? You know, I just, it's really hard to sit down. It's really uncomfortable. I got to pace. I got to move, rock back and forth, that kind of thing. It, it, it happens in Parkinson's disease. It also happens when you give healthy people medicines that, that block dopamine that, that cause Parkinsonism temporarily. So it has something to do with dopamine. And often um, optimizing Parkinson's treatment can uh, take care of that. I put it here with anxiety because it doesn't often have like worries and stuff like it, but it's that t dreadful sense of dis-ease and like I have to get up um, gets viewed as anxiety sometimes. <coughs> I already mentioned off-period anxiety. So again, if the timing of the anxiety seems to track with the timing of when you can't swallow or talk or walk very well, Again, treating the dopamine symptoms may help better. Okay, panic. Let me come to that. Um, here's the official boring definition recurrent uh, of panic disorder. Recurrent unexpected panic attacks and more than a month of either worrying or changing your behavior because of the panic attacks. Often it's accompanied by agoraphobia, which means um, literally fear of the marketplace, but it means discomfort with going out of the house or being in certain situations like crowds, ball games. So what is a panic attack? So for doctors what it means is a discrete period of intense fear or discomfort in which you have at least four of these symptoms that come on abruptly, not there all day long or for hours, but come on fairly suddenly and reach a peak within a few minutes. 
So it kind of feels like out of the blue, oh my goodness, something is wrong, I'm dying. <clears throat> Symptoms include things like palpitations, sweating, trembling, shortness of breath is really classic, a choking feeling, chest pain, nausea, dizziness, feeling that you're not really there or that you're not really real, fear of going crazy, fear of dying, and so on. <coughs> Oops. Okay, here's the main point for today about panic. Panic attacks are very treatable, okay? It's really one of the most treatable things we have. There are two basic kinds of treatment, and you, most people need both for panic. Um, there's medications and there's cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, the first choice of medications for panic are antidepressant medicines. Now, I say that it doesn't mean you're depressed. Like, lots of people with panic disorder are not depressed. But the class of medicines that we happen to call antidepressants, because that's what they were originally sold for, that's what works best. It, the downside is it takes several weeks before they work. And the other downside is that people with panic attacks are especially sensitive to medication side effects. You know, the tummy goes flip and you feel like you're going to die. So you have to be patient with it. You have to take it. You maybe have to start at a lower dose and work up over the course of a month or so. The, the medications that people want for panic attacks, benzodiazepines are basically like tranquilizers. This is your Valium type medicines. Um, they, they may temporarily reduce the severity of panic symptoms and, and if a psychiatrist is prescribing them in a careful way that isn't the way they're usually prescribed, it can be good. But usually they're not a good long-term choice in people with Parkinson's. So do, how many of you know Morvid Karimi? Well. Morvid used to come to me all the time, why are you trying to kill my patient? You're giving him that medicine, you know? And she was, I think, a little overboard, but she, she, she was right on that this can be um, bad in terms of side effects for people with Parkinson. So benzodiazepines or these tranquilizers, they're basically like alcohol in terms of benefits and side effects. They make you feel calmer, but it makes you um, wobbly, um, and it can make you dumb, right? I mean, just like alcohol. So <clears throat> depending on the dose and when you take it and all this kind of stuff. But people with Parkinson's already are unsteady on their feet, so that's the reason we, we don't jump to those first case. Okay, behavior therapy um, is the only thing that works for the, the worst, the most disabling part of panic disorder, which is avoidance. So I've had people tell me, oh no, it doesn't cause me any problems at all. And I said, well, so like, when's the last time you went to a ball game? What? I would never go to a ball game. You know, and you're like, okay, well, I, I get it that you're, you've reduced your life activities to where it isn't bothering you because you're not having any of these experiences, but that's not really, that's not really great either. So, off-period panic may be different. We've discussed that already. Okay. Another kind of anxiety, social anxiety disorder. Any of you see the movie called The Princess Diaries? Okay. So this scene, there's a scene at the beginning where our, our hero, our heroine here, she's sitting there about to get up and give a talk and she already looks terribly uncomfortable. And she gets up to give the talk and she looks even worse and then she runs out of the room to throw up. Everybody remember that? Anyway, I liked it. I got kids. What can I say? Okay, that's kind of what we're talking about. The idea that when everybody's staring at you and you're supposed to get up and perform, that you feel terribly uncomfortable. Now, this is common. Both of us are sitting here feeling a little uncomfortable because we're getting up here talking and everybody's looking at us. But for some people, it really takes over their life and causes problems. The classic idea would be things like, I feel anxious when I'm in a social situation and I become the center of attention. Like you're the one who just walked in from the street into a big party. Or um, the teacher calls on you in a class with 100 people in it. Those kind of situations. I feel anxious when speaking in front of strangers or in front of people in general. Often people with social anxiety grew up shy. They would tell me they would never raise their hand in class or volunteer for a book report. Um, they're usually fine with small groups of friends, and so they think, well, I'm not, I'm not antisocial or anything. Like, I, I've got friends. I don't mind talking with my five buddies. But you put you in a room with 100 people, and all of a sudden it's like, I'm never going to raise my hand or say anything. Uh, may pass on a promotion if the promotion would involve public speaking. Um, here's the official definition. I'm going to skip for a second. But you can look at it later. It's fairly common. Somewhere probably 3 to 10% of the general population probably has social anxiety. It's moderately heritable. And interestingly, in people, young folks who don't have Parkinson's, dopamine blocking drugs can cause some of the symptoms. Um, it's one problem with treating children with Tourette's syndrome is they can, they can develop school phobia. But social anxiety is much more common in Parkinson's, around one in three patients with Parkinson's. And having asked about 100 people with Parkinson's or more, I don't know how many, 
about social anxiety, um, it, they usually tell me it started early in their life, well before they had any motor symptoms, like, oh yeah, I was a shy kid, I did blah, you know, I, um, I actually did get an offer to have a promotion, but I turned it down because, you know, I'd have to go out and talk to 100 people on the shop floor or whatever. The, again, social anxiety is very treatable, either with medications or with CBT. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. Okay, other things. I think I have like three more slides here. Insomnia. Anybody ever heard of insomnia? Okay, never mind. <laughs> Extremely common, and there are many different causes of it. There are a few causes that are really dopamine related, and your neurologist can fix easily. So, like, okay, not easily, but they'll work on it. Um, like, I can't turn over in bed at night. I can't adjust the sheets. Very common. Wearing off symptoms that happen in the middle of the night. Um, dystonia. So if you have cramping in your toes and that's worse at night, you know, that's going to wake you up maybe. <clears throat> Akathisia or restless legs. <clears throat> and urinary urgency, so Johanna will address that a little bit. These are all things that can sometimes be related to and be fixed by playing around with the Parkinson medication. There are other causes. REM sleep behavior disorder means that um, the way I think about it is like, how many of you have driven, driven a stick shift? Oh, good. I'm not feeling as old as Okay, so, like, you know how, it, like, if you, if you press in on the clutch, then you can rev the engine without going anywhere? So normally when you dream, this is what happens. It's like your body puts in the clutch and your brain's going all crazy, you know, and you're flying through the air and you're, you're fighting the alligators or whatever. And anybody watching you just sees you blink a few times and stuff like that. Okay, um, what happens in REM sleep behavior disorder is the clutch starts to pop and you start actually acting out the dreams. So that can be a real problem. You know, like I had one guy that was, woke up when he was climbing out a window, you know, um, as part of his dream. So, uh, Depression is a very common cause of insomnia. The classic feature there is waking up early in the morning and you, you just can't go back to sleep for no obvious reason. Like, you know. Anxiety, typically it's like I can't fall asleep at night because I'm sitting there planning the next day and I'm worrying about all the problems that could come up and I don't know what could happen next and what about my kids, are they going to be safe and all that kind of stuff. And there's a bunch of other causes of insomnia. Um, again, the point is, I think this is worth bringing to the attention of your physicians. Um, and it usually, often is treatable. Impulse control disorders. So this is a fancy word for, we gave you a, a drug to treat Parkinson's, usually a dopamine agonist, and you started doing things that would get you in trouble. Okay? Um, examples. Um, gambling, somebody who, like, never really gambled, and then all of a sudden, like, a few weeks after they get started on a new medicine for Parkinson's, they go out and waste all kinds of money and get the house in, in, in debt. Sexual indiscretions that, again, are new for somebody or never used to be a problem, and now they're a real problem. Shopping binges, dumpster diving, um, walkabouts, like just wandering, you know, in the winter without putting on your coat and you're just wandering and can't really explain why when you get home. That kind of stuff could all be... Um, caused by medication, basically. It's probably also caused by the Parkinson's, but that we can't fix as easily. Okay, this is, I think, the last slide here. Dementia, there's, we could give a whole hour talk about this. But what this refers to is a worsening over a period of years, not in a day or two, not in a week, but over a period of months to years, you have worsening of higher brain functions, things like memory, that's the classic one you think about, but also calculations, remembering how to use a remote, um, organizing events. Um, less commonly in Parkinson's, you have uh, language being affected, <clears throat> difficulty understanding things or using the right word. Dementia is fairly uncommon in early classic Parkinson's disease. In the first five or ten years, we don't see much of it. But the longer the disease goes on, um, the more common it is. Until when people have lived 20 or 30 years with Parkinson's, it becomes more common than not. The first thing the doctor needs to do if dementia is, seems to be there is to make sure it's not something that we can fix easily. Like, oh, that's funny, when we started you on Benadryl or whatever, you, your brain got slower. Or your thyroid's low or you have an infection or, you know, whatever. Um, Dr. Perlmutter showed that most patients with Parkinson dementia either have Lewy bodies spread throughout their head or they have um, amyloid deposits in the head in a way that doesn't really look like um, Alzheimer's disease. So it's probably a different kind of illness, but the effects are similar. 
Um, there's mild benefit for medications like rivastigmine. We don't have any great cures for it at this point. Okay. Whoa. That's it.